In the previous video, we were looking at this idea of finding the area under the curve. Right? So if you remember, the shape we worked with last time was not uh, any uniform shape that we worked with, so we needed to use a number of rectangles to approximate the area. And when we came up with this formula, right? So we came up with the sum, remember sigma is just a sum, a repeated sum, right? From i equals one to n of f of x sub i uh, times delta x. And so n is the total number of rectangles. So we basically stacked a bunch of rectangles under those curves, under the curve, right? Um, we chose f of x sub i to be the height of the, of the ith rectangle. Right? So for each rectangle, we gave it a certain height. We also had a uniform width, delta x, for all these rectangles. So you can think of this as our width. Think of this as our height. And so we multiply this together to get an area. And then we just sum up the area of each rectangle to get our total area. And that's exactly what this formula is telling us. Right? So in the previous video, that's we sort of derived this formula. Today, we will go over a few more conventions regarding this formula and then put it into action. Right? So let's go ahead and dive right into it. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this, same, this problem. It's the same one we talked about in our very first integral calculus video. So let's go ahead and actually use what we've learned about this, this formula here, which is also known as a Riemann sum, to go ahead and uh, evaluate this area and calculate this displacement. Right? So let's do that. The first thing we always do though is we find our delta x. And now because delta x is a uniform width, the math associated with it is actually quite nice. Right? So we just need to take the end point of this interval, the starting point of this interval, and divide by the number of rectangles. Right? So we're gonna have b minus a over n. And so we're gonna have 10 minus zero over five. So each rectangle we have is going to have a width of two. Right? That's basically what we found doing this math here. Great, so now we can go ahead and lay out what this formula is gonna be, right? So our area is going to be the sum from i equals one to five, right? Because we're, we're using n equals five or five rectangles of f of x of i star. If you wanted, you could make, you could put in the function here. I just don't think it's necessary, um, but you would use this function in here um, times delta x. Or in this case, we already know what delta x is, so we could just put in times two, right? But let's flesh this out a little bit more, right? So again, two is a common width, so we can just factor that out and then we could say, all right, so we have f of x sub one plus f of x sub two plus f of x three plus f of x sub four. Excellent. So now we have, we're almost there. Just one thing to keep in mind though. There's just, so we're almost there. But there's one thing that does come up here. Each rectangle is gonna have a width of two, that's okay. So we have a rectangle here, a rectangle here. So we have our first rectangle is gonna be from here to here, another one from here to here, here to here, here to here, and here to here. But when choosing the height of this rectangle, our formula does not specify what point on each of these subintervals to choose the height as, right? So what I mean by this is that you might say, all right, uh, let's choose a rectangle. Let's draw this last rectangle here like this, right? Because this point over here is on this subinterval, right? So let's choose that to be the height of our rectangle. But then I could come in and say, well, no, I don't like that to be the height of my rectangle. I want this point right here to be the height of my rectangle. So I could draw the rectangle like this instead. And as per this definition, both of those are correct, right? Uh, it, our function, this definition cannot distinguish between this and this by itself because both of these, right, are simply 
heights of the rectangle for each of these widths or subintervals, right? But they both give drastically different answers. So therefore, we need some kind of uh, a convention, if you will, for actually figuring out what those for actually figuring out um, which of these heights we want to choose to do our calculation, so that there can be some form of you know, clarity about what we're do about what we're doing there. So that's what we're going to talk about in just a second here. So here's the conventions that we have for choosing where on our on each subinterval to to place the height of our rectangle. Right. So we have the left-hand Riemann sum, the midpoint Riemann sum, and the right-hand Riemann sum. So with the left point, with the left-hand Riemann sum, we choose the height of our rectangle to be at the leftmost point of each uh, subinterval. So for example, in this case, if our width is two we pick the leftmost point, or zero in that case, to be our height. Right? So for the next rectangle, we pick two here to be our height, and so on and so forth. Visually, what this means is that you're always going to be placing the left corner of each of your rectangles on this curve. Right? That's what that would mean uh, visually. The right-hand Riemann sum, with this one, you do just the opposite. We choose the far right of the interval to, be, to, to choose for our height of f of x, right? So for example, over here, you can see this, we're still dealing with that zero to two interval, but this time we chose the height of our rectangle at two instead of zero, right? Like over here, we chose zero, here we've now chosen two. And for the next one, we choose four, now this one here, we chose six and so on and so forth. So we choose the rightmost uh, value at our interval, of our interval for that height there, right? And visually, you are always going to be placing the right corner of your rectangle on the function, right? So here you can see here the right corner of this rectangle of each rectangle lies is sort of uh, poking the function there. So lastly, midpoint, so the midpoint sum. Uh, this one is not used as commonly because the math associated with it, with it is a is a little bit more tedious, and we'll, we'll go over some examples in the next video that will show you why. But basically what we do is we choose the center of our interval to be uh, the height of our rectangle, right? So for this case, again, we have, we're going our interval is 0 to 2, so we chose our height at x equals 1, right? Right in the bang in the middle of that interval. And that's the case for all of these. So here our interval is 2 to 4, so we choose our height at 3, and so on and so forth. So over here, um, and that's how that works there. So visually, what this would look like is you can kind of see the midpoint of each rectangle is piercing, is pierced by the function, right? So you can see the function is, it's going through all these rectangles and it's piercing each of them at the midpoint, right? It's coming out of each rectangle at the midpoint there. So that's what kind of what that looks like visually. So this is the convention that we use for choosing the height of our rectangle. So that's another very important piece of information that you'll be getting, you'll need to get from each of these problems. All right, so let's go back to this problem here, and you'll notice I've given you another really important piece of information, right? So I've told you you still have to use five rectangles, but I've also told you that we're gonna be using a right-hand Riemann sum. So this removes the whole ambiguity about where that, about how tall that rectangle is gonna be, right? So that, now, now uh, anyone who does this problem should get the same answer as you, all right? So let's do the right-hand Riemann sum here. And I've kind of, I've sketched in those rectangles for us. Once again, as you can see, the right point of each, the right corner of each rectangle is P, is uh, touching the function there, right? So let's go ahead and uh, let's do this problem. So now given that we use, now given that for the right-hand Riemann sum, we pick the rightmost point of each interval. Let's go ahead and actually see what each of these would come out to. Right, so for this first one here, right, we're picking this first interval is from zero to two, so we choose two as our right, uh, as our height there. So we're going to pick, so we're, gonna, we're choosing two as the place to evaluate our height. So we'll have f of two plus for this next subinterval, it's going to be up here. So we'll have four f of four. This next one will be f of six plus Next one here will be f of 8 plus f of 10. Right, so we've chosen 
these different, we've chosen the right hand uh, Riemann sum here, and we've picked the rightmost point of each of these subintervals to choose the height for a rectangle. All right? And now it's just a matter of evaluating the function in each of these points, adding them together and multiplying by two. So I'm gonna, I'll save you the math on these and I will quickly calculate these numbers myself and then we'll, get, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene here in just a second. All right, so those are the numbers we'll end up with if you actually evaluated each of those. Um, I'm gonna trust that you know how to do that so we don't need to go through the steps, but that's what you'd end up with. And now we just gotta, we just gotta go ahead and add these and multiply by two. And if you do that, what we get is, this will be two in the inside here, we'll get 64. So our final answer will end up being 128. And if we're using the right units, we'll get 128 meters. So if if this car's velocity is changing, is defined by this function, uh, on this interval from zero to 10 meter, to 10 hours, uh, it would have traveled 128 meters. That's what this is telling us. And that's an important thing to remember, right? Uh, just because we are dealing with the geometric idea of calculating areas, doesn't mean we can forget the idea of what this means. We're still taking a velocity function and we're, con we're, finding, the, uh, we're finding displacement. That's something we should always, that's something that's really important to remember as we go through uh, these problems here. All right, let's just do one more example just to really hammer home uh, what, this is, what the Riemann sum is all about. So in this example, we're given a velocity function again, and we wanna calculate displacement after eight seconds using four rectangles and a left-hand uh, Riemann sum. So all our information is there for us once again. So just like last time, let's start by calculating delta x. So once again, this is b minus a over n. So the end point of our interval is eight, starting point is zero, and we're doing four rectangles. So eight over four is just gonna be two. So each of our rectangles is gonna have a width of two. And now since we're using a left-hand Riemann sum, remember we're gonna be choosing the height of each rectangle to be the leftmost point of each of our subintervals here. So for this first one, for example, um, if that's our first rectangle there, we're gonna be picking the height to be over here. So that first rectangle there would look um, like that. It's a bad rectangle, but uh, you, you get the point. So that's that. All right, so let's go ahead and do this then. So our area is going to be, once again, we'll have the sum from i equals one, but since we're using four rectangles, we can just put a four up there. Um, f of x so i, and our width we already know is two. And so what this will foil out to, once again, we can factor the two out. So we'll have, and we can go straight into, um, this part here. So we can go straight into figuring out what um, what uh, what heights we'll be choosing. So for this first one, since we're using a left-hand Riemann sum, we'll be picking zero as our uh, as the x value for our first height. Right? So we'll be going with f of zero. Uh, for the next rectangle, it'll still be a left-hand Riemann sum. So it's going to be like down here. So we'll have two as the next one. And then if we look it down further, we'll have four for the next subinterval. And for the last one here, it'll be f of six. Okay. So that's that. So let's just go ahead and evaluate these and and uh, yeah, let's just see what we get. So f of zero, um, but this one is a little bit easier to just do by hand, so we can do this together. F of zero, again, that's just gonna be minus four squared, which is gonna be 16 minus nine is just going to be, um, <clears throat> it's just gonna give us seven. So we have a seven there. And then F of two, that's gonna be two minus four squared. Um, so that would be, all right, so f of two, we'll have two minus four squared. It's gonna be minus, the minus two is at 11, so we're just gonna have four minus nine, so this this would be minus five. 
Now I know what you might be wondering. So if this is a height, that would give us a negative area, right? For that, that rectangle there, we'd have a negative area. And areas are not negative, right? Because they're physical quantities. And that's definitely true, right? That's definitely true. But we can't just ignore the negative sign because it has a meaning for us in another context, right? If we think about this as a, as a displacement, it does mean something to us. A negative displacement can exist. So we will preserve the negative sign, um, but we're just gonna, but we do understand though that area inherently cannot be negative. So we're just putting that negative sign there just to tell ourselves that, all right, we happen to be going below the x-axis with this particular rectangle, right? So that's all we're saying. So the area of the rectangle itself is a positive number, but because this area dips below the x-axis and has a negative y value, uh, we assign it a negative area, right? And the reason for that is again, because it has, um, it, it, it does mean something in the context of displacement, right? So that's that. F of four, well, this entire thing is gonna go to zero. The entire stuff under the square, we just get a zero. So we're just, just gonna be minus nine. And same thing here, if we actually drew that rectangle out, you would see it would uh, be something like this. And so because that rectangle dips below the x-axis, we assign it a negative value. F of six, so six minus four, that's again two squared. So that's four minus nine. So we have another minus five there. Okay. So once again, just add everything together, multiply by two. And so what we'll get is uh, we'll have minus 10, minus 19. Uh, plus 7, so it would be minus 12. So we have 2 times, um, we'll have a minus 12 in here. And so this gives us um, minus 24. And once again, our units will be meters. So her displacement, our cyclist's displacement after 8 seconds, if that's her velocity, uh, is going to be 24 meters, minus 24 meters. And displacement can be negative, so that's totally fine because displacement is a vector quantity, it has direction. So this is saying that she went 24 mile, which 24 meters um, in the negative direction of her starting point. So that's, that's that. All right, so we covered a lot of different things in this video, so let's just put it all together in a quick conclusion. So we talked about the idea of a Riemann sum. So when we use a finite, finite number of rectangles, to estimate the area under a curve on a given interval, right? That's basically the whole process we've been doing uh, over the course of these last few uh, examples. We also talked about the left hand, the right hand, and the midpoint Riemann sum. And again, these are just ways for, uh, this is just a convention, so to say, for determining what the height of our rectangle is gonna be on the given interval. So we know what the height is gonna be the function itself. This just tells us sort of, um, this is a convention for like how tall we should make our rectangle on that given interval, right? We also talked a little bit about signed areas. So this is kind of what we, we, we came up across in the, the most recent example, where we talked about how that rectangle went below the x-axis, so we gave it, we assigned it a negative area. So this is what we say. So areas above the x-axis are considered positive, while areas below the x-axis are considered negative. Right? So that doesn't mean the area itself is positive, that area itself is positive or negative. We're just assigning those negative and positive values because they have certain meanings outside the, the mere context of width times height for us, right? For example, if we're talking about a displacement, that area can be negative. So that's what uh, that's where that's where that comes from. So that's it for this video. Uh, in the next video, we'll do some more practice. So I will see you guys over there. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe leave a comment and check out some other videos. See you next time.